sing it to him. Oh, how yeah, you are I, I to do one more time, sing it out, Jesus sweet.
physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. Father, put us back together like only your power and only your spirit can do. I thank you, Jesus, today for your kindness. It's not your condemnation, it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. It leads us to closer communion with you. I pray that we experience that today. God, we love you. We love you today. It's in your mighty name we pray, amen, amen. Come on, let's celebrate the name of Jesus today. Come on, he's worthy today, amen. Amen, church. So glad that you chose to be here today. I want you to greet those around you, and then you can go ahead and take your seat. glad that you're here. Here's what we have coming up at our church. We have an opportunity every year to partner with local schools to identify families that are struggling to make ends meet and we're going to provide them with groceries all summer long. There are three ways you can help with this. First is bringing non-perishable food items. Every Sunday now through July you can bring canned goods and non-perishable food items and drop them in the lobby. You can also adopt a family. You'll be assigned to a specific family, shop for their groceries, and personally deliver them on the last Saturday of May, June, and July. Then there's our delivery team, where you can sign up to pack and deliver groceries. For more information and to sign up, you can visit cityhope.cc outreach. Corrections Officer Appreciation Week is coming up soon. We currently serve in many correctional facilities in the area. As a matter of fact, we just launched our fifth ministry this month. We cannot do that without the support of wardens and officers in those facilities. As you can imagine, they work in jobs that are often thankless, and we wanna make sure they know how much we love and appreciate them too. We're gonna to be cooking for them on site, and we'll have the opportunity to look them eye to eye and give them a big old thank you. If you wanna be a part of one or more of these days, you can sign up at cityhope.cc slash correctional. We're in an exciting series right now called Let's Talk About It, where we're talking about anything and everything that might be a hot cultural subject. And if you wanna dive deeper into previous week's subjects, we've created a resource page at cityhope.cc slash resources that we're updating weekly with a selection of books related to each week's topic. And today, we'll be talking about gender dysphoria and the transgender movement. Next week, we'll be talking about sexuality and why God cares about who we sleep with. And we feel that these topics may not be appropriate for children, and we highly recommend checking any children in to Kid City today and next week as well. We know the content of this series will help us understand these topics in a deeper way and equip us to be able to talk about it ourselves. If you're new to our church, we would love to eat a free lunch with you after service next Sunday at something we call Welcome to City Hope. This is a chance for us to get to know you and for you to have a space to find out more about City Hope and have questions answered. 
Don't miss out on this fantastic opportunity to build relationships with others and find your place in our church family. Lunch and child care are provided and you can register at cityhope.cc slash welcome. All right, well, good morning, church. How we doing? Hey, thanks for being here. Welcome, everybody. As you saw from the video, we are continuing our series. Let's talk about it. You guys enjoyed this series so far? Well, hey, today and next week, we are diving into subjects that we know are important for our church. It's important to meet God's truth in a timely way when it comes to culture, when it comes to what we're facing every single day. Uh, and so, it is important, but also, just like you saw in the video, maybe you saw the signs on the way in, it's also important that it's age appropriate. So just one last warning, I'll do it this way. If you are hearing the words of my voice right now and your age is still in the single digits, all right, I'm talking nine and under, maybe just tug on mom and dad's sleeve and be like, hey, I feel like they're gonna get into it today. Maybe, maybe let's go check out Kid City. So that's our final warning, just because we wanna make sure that as we have this important conversation, we have the age-appropriate conversation as well. That's my PG-13 warning, but I also have to do a PG-13 invitation. Where are my middle school and high school students at? Anybody in the room, middle school, high school? Whoop, whoop, yeah, I get it, it's 9 a.m. 11 a.m., they're gonna go out loud for that, but 9 a.m., middle school and high school. This Wednesday is Collective de Mayo. It's a big deal, there we go. You just need to know what you're cheering for. I get it now. Collective de Mayo. If you don't speak Spanish, Collective de Mayo just means Collective of May. There you go. I helped you out. The more you know. But we have four collectives uh, a year. This is one of them. And this is where all the campuses, middle school and high school, come together for worship, for a message, and for a fun after party. So if you are a middle schooler, high schooler, if you know one, get them here this Wednesday because it's going to be an incredible time. Well, right now we have a team in Honduras at our Jungle Hospital that's a construction crew, and they're helping with a long list of projects just to spruce up our Jungle Hospital. Here's a picture of them right here on the bus. Pastor Jerry's leading the way. I feel like with Pastor Jerry on that, it's not just a jungle hospital. They might build a jungle post office, a jungle hotel. They might get a lot done, but if you could just join me real quick, we're just gonna pray for this team in the week that they're gonna have. God, thank you so much for every single person on this trip that gave up their time, their expertise, Lord, they paid their own way to be on this trip so that they can go and bless others. So thank, thank you so much for a team like this that would help us continue the ministry, the important ministry that we're doing of meeting the physical and spiritual needs in the hospital of Honduras. Thank you so much for this crew. Keep them safe. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, if you have your Bible, if you have your notebook, get ready. Here we go. Part four of Let's Talk About It. What's up, church? How's everybody doing? Welcome. Hey, welcome to church today. I'm so glad you're here wherever you are, wherever you're watching from. Uh, we're really, really glad that you are with us today um, as we are in part four of Let's Talk About It. So let's talk about it. You ready? Yes. All right. Hey, listen, let me give you just a couple of things up front. One is this. Even if you disagree, no matter what campus you're at, no matter where you're watching from, even if you disagree with what I say today, I really hope more than anything else that you feel loved here. Because my guess is there will be disagreement, but I pray and I hope that what you hear and feel today is love. And in light of that, church, I'm gonna ask you to do something that's very unusual. Um, I really enjoy it when you talk back to me, when you clap, when you moo. Um, I really enjoy that. Um, it actually helps. I think I'm a better preacher when you're talking to me and you're clapping. 
But I'm, I'm actually going to ask you not to do that today. Um, and I know for this service in particular, the 9 o'clock, that may be a little bit difficult. You're a, you're a talkative bunch. I love it, by the way. Um, but what it does or what I don't want it to do is mi- I don't want someone to misinterpret it as we're not a welcome place. This is not a place of love or a place that someone could find a home here. Okay, does that make sense? You with me? So, so I, just, I want us to refrain from that today, if at all possible. Um, the second thing that I want to say, so number one is I, I hope and I pray that you feel loved today. The second thing I would say is this, is my aim today, my bullseye today is to teach you God's word. Okay, my bullseye today is to show you what God's word says because we believe his word is, is breathed by the Holy Spirit. It is his plan for fulfillment. It's his plan for happiness. It's his plan for joy. It's his plan for purpose. And so that's my hope today to be able to convey that to you, okay? So we're gonna answer the question today, what does God think about uh, gender dysphoria and the transgender movement? Um, and just to say it in a very kind of real way, there are people right now under the sound of my voice that are battling, struggling, dealing with this very thing. And the statistics tell us that it's really affecting our teenagers and even our children more so than it would be adults. The way it's impacting our world, adolescence, is just at a crazy rate. So what that means is there are a lot of people dealing with this, and there may be a lot of parents that are dealing with this that are struggling with how do I approach this? How do I handle this? How do I deal with this? Because culture and even some science and research is saying one thing and then we know God's word or some of us at least, we kind of know God's word and we, we, we have a different feel. So there's a struggle. So this is a very kind of high pain point for a lot of people. Okay, so that's how we're kind of entering into this conversation today. So let me start by doing this. Let me start by kind of helping you understand the, uh, the view and kind of help you understand the way that the transgender movement sees gender and sexuality, okay? I'm gonna show you an image, and this image is a widely used image or tool to help people that are struggling with gender dysphoria to help people kind of understand their gender versus their sex, Okay, it's called the gender-bred person. You may have seen this before, Um, but this is what it looks like. And this is, like I said, it's a tool that's being used. There's actually a a real, even more kid-friendly version called the gender unicorn um, that's being used that helps communicate, okay, that's communicating to mainly um, children, but really anybody to understand how through this movement and this ideology and this lens, gender and sex have been separated, okay? So if you look at this, it's this, here's our gender, our gender bred person, and the, at the mind level is what is called gender identity, which means that it's how a person self-perceives themselves. It's how they look and feel about their own self. In other words, they could be male, they could be female, or what you're gonna see and what you'll understand is that this view says that it's a spectrum. So you could be anywhere between male or female any given time, any given day, okay? Because your gender identity is in the mind. It's how you you perceive yourself. And then there's the heart, which is who you're attracted to, okay? Emotionally, it's who you're attracted to, whatever sex, male, female, again, or anything in between. It's on a spectrum. And then there's the body, which is kind of expression or gender expression. So it's how you express yourself, which could be completely different from how you view yourself in your mind and your biology, your biological sex, it could be completely different. Male, female, anywhere in between. And then last, of course, the genitals, which is where you have your biological sex, the way that you were born. So this view is saying that now biology, the sex, male or female, is separate from how we can identify. Okay, that our identity can actually be separate. They can be two different things because what really matters is what's in my mind. What really matters is how I feel. Let me define two more terms just to help us today. One is this, one is transgender. Um, And this is a really great book. It's on our resource page, but this is how they define it. An umbrella term for many experiences of gender identity that do not align normatively with a person's biological sex. 
So it's an umbrella term. It can kind of mean anything in all of those different kind of spectrums. Anybody that could be this side to that side or anywhere in between. It's anyone dealing with, experiencing, struggling, um, walking out that kind of lifestyle would fit underneath this, this umbrella. Now, this term is different than a term that you may have heard before. It's often confused, uh, the term intersex. Okay, intersex is this, it's a general term used for a variety of conditions in which a person is born with reproductive or sexual anatomy that doesn't seem to fit the typical definitions of female or male. And you'll notice this is from the Intersex Society of North America. Okay, so this, this is a intersex and it's often kind of used in conjunction with transgender or transgenderism, but it's different because this is an extremely rare birth defect. Okay, it's 0.018% of babies are born where their genitals are unclear. They do not know whether male or female just by genitals alone. And the Intersex Society of North America will tell you, and they're very clear about it, that intersex is not the same as transgenderism, even though they kind of get combined and lumped together sometimes. Okay. So what I want you to see, just think back, I'm not gonna put the gender bread man back up there, but just think back to that image and think back to the spectrums and think back to kind of the way now the, the person is able to be broken down. Everything is on a spectrum. Everything is, is broken apart separately. So what that means is that a person's identity can change from day to day, minute to minute, week to week, whatever. The way they express themselves, the, who they're attracted to can change over and over and over again. There was a, a documentary that I watched and just part of the research for this. And there was a mom talking about her 12, her 12 year old child. And she said this, this mom said, some days Annie is a girl and some days Annie is a boy and some days she's both. And she goes on to talk about this 12-year-old child, and she said whenever they were getting ready for her graduation, they had to buy a dress and a suit because they didn't know on that day which sex she would identify with. And then the mom said this. She said, Annie believes that gender is more of a mental trait rather than a physical trait. And this is really, really important as we attempt to try to understand What's going on? And whenever I read this, and I, I imagine for a lot of you, whenever you read this, it breaks your heart. It breaks my heart. I know it breaks the Father's heart. But what it also does is it just screams confusion. Whenever I see this, and I, I, I see all of these different scales and spectrums and all these different divisions, it just looks like confusing confusion. And for me, the, the question is, did, did God intend for humanity to be this confused over our sexuality and our gender? Like, is, was, was this God's intention? Is this what God wanted? To so just lay a little bit more foundation, really, before we jump in, I'm, I'm, I'm really just still setting the stage here, just FYI. We got some time, by the way. I built in extra time today. To really kind of set the foundation, I want to I want to kind of show you three ideologies that are now part of our society, part of our culture that are traced back to the sexual revolution of the 60s. Okay, these are ideologies that are are very much part of our society that what you're going to see is is kind of how we got here. I'm I'm going to kind of I'm going to show you kind of how we got to this place that if you're like me, you look at this and you go, I don't understand. This is so confusing. Okay, I want to kind of, as best I can, show you how we got there. There are three ideologies that are now part of our society that came from the, or you can trace back to the sexual revolution. First one is the idea of expressive individualism, okay, which means that now my feelings and what I feel is the God of me, okay? It's what, what happened was is we took our feelings and made them the governing authority of our lives, Okay, and what scripture tells us is that our feelings, our heart is deceitful above much. So what you and I need is broken humanity is we actually need a higher authority that is higher than us, right? But our society says now what is our highest authority is me, my feelings. The second um, ideology from the sexual revolution would be the idea that, um, that our sexuality is now a core part of our identity, 
okay? That, that me expressing my sexuality is the most important thing about me. It is core to who I am. This is the first time, as far as we can tell, the first time in human history that a culture has taken sex from an activity, something you do, to and make it an identity, something I am. The first time ever that we've seen that sexuality go just from being an act, something we do in the physical, to now being this core identifier of who I am. Sexuality has been elevated to that point. The third ideology is really the one that speaks, I think, the most clearly to transgenderism and this issue as a, as a whole. And I would even encourage you, I'm gonna throw out one more resource for you, and this is also on the resource site. Um, but if you wanna do a little bit more digging on this, a great resource is a book called Love Thy Body by Nancy Piercy. Um, deep, a lot of theology, um, but it's fantastic. But she does a great job. I'm, I'm throwing this out quick, but... Um, but the third ideology is this. It's the idea of personhood. Okay, it's the idea of who we are as a person. Okay, the kind of the, the worldview of what a person is. So traditionally, we would say a person is both mind and body. It's this kind of holistic view. But in current society and kind of where we've gone the last 40 or 50 years, the current worldview looks like this. There's a division, go ahead to that next slide. There's a division between our mind and our body. Now they are separated. So our, the entire worldview of who you are as a person has now changed in our society. That the mind or kind of who I am as a person is separate from my body. What that means is, is that now we can look at our body as just raw material with no moral value whatsoever. A very consistent term is used when, when in this kind of world is meat skeleton. Your body is just a meat skeleton. It is there to, to, to serve whatever purpose you desire for it to serve. Okay, it's separated from who you are. And honestly, this is a very Darwinian kind of evolutionary thought because if, if there is no God, think Darwin, if there is no God, therefore you are not created, you evolved. What's evolving, what's important about you is your mind. Your body is evolving over centuries and centuries and centuries. What's important is our consciousness, is our mind. And so that's what's elevated above everything else. So our bodies are just kind of, they're whatever we want them to be. There's this separated picture of mind and body. This is the world's view. So what I want to do is I want to kind of answer four questions. And the first one would be this. What is God's view of our body? Okay. How does God see personhood? Okay. It's very different. Here's how God sees personhood. God sees us as mind, body, and soul interconnected, created in the image of God. Okay. This is... This is from Genesis 1, this is the way that we were created. We were created connected as one. In other words, your body matters, right? Because you are, you are a whole person connected in the way God designed you and created you to be connected. In Genesis 1, we see this from the very, very beginning. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So what did God do? God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them what? Male and female, he created them. Most of us are so familiar with this story. We kind of understand the creation story. And you know, if you, if you think back through the story, that every time God created something, he would say, it's good. It's good. Until he got to mankind. When he got to humanity, what did he say? He said, it's... I know I told you not to talk back to me, but that's a little different. Like, that's a question. Okay, he said, very good, right? Right? God said, listen, whenever he created humanity, he said, that is very good. What I want you to understand is that there was a very big distinction between humanity and the rest of creation. And the distinction was the image of God. The difference is, what's different about you and I than everything else is that humanity is the only thing that God put his image on. And, not, and he did not put his image on one sex or the other sex. He put his image on mankind, which is distinctively two genders, two sex, male and female. So whenever or if we were to ever lose genders, you know, in some hope that, it's, that we become a genderless society one day, if we were to ever lose genders, then guess what we lose? The image of God. 
Because without those two distinct genders, then we lose God's plan. We lose God's image on this earth. You and I are image bearers on this earth, male and female created in that way. Now, some people would look and they would say, but what if God made a mistake with my body? You know, what if, what if God messed up? Whenever God was assigning genders and assigning sex, what if he messed up on me? The, the question is really, does God make mistakes? Does God mess up? And in Psalm 139, I think David answers this so, so well. He says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know that full well. In the Hebrew, this term, knit me together, it's just this picture of, 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 of precision and care, this intricate, this detail, this, man, the, it's just this picture of God taking so much time to put you together. David says, you and I, we were created, we were fearfully and wonderfully made, but I love this, this statement right here, your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. David is known for kind of looking at the mountains and the stars and the sky and just being in awe of God because of what he created. What he's saying is, I'm, I can look at the mountains, I can look at the sea, I can look at the beauty in this world, and I know that your works are wonderful. And if those works are wonderful and I carry the image of God, then I know that this work is wonderful. He said, I know, God, that you cared about me, that you created me. You know, I don't know, I don't know what kind of vehicle you drove here today, but um, I, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but every, every vehicle has roughly 37,000 parts in it which is kind of amazing if you think about it for a second. If you think 37,000 parts are working together to make that vehicle work, and no one anywhere in all of you know, automotive history has ever thought that that vehicle magically put itself together over time, and that magically 37,000 parts figured out over time how to operate and how to become a vehicle. No, we all look and we go, someone designed it, someone built it. There's a design and a designer, there's a creator, someone created it. You and I, our human body that David is talking about here has 37 trillion parts. That's 37 with 12 zeros behind it. Okay, 37 trillion cells in our body that were, that were designed and put together so that you and I operate and function and work the way that we work. There's no way that it beca- it's accidental. There's no way that there wasn't a design and a designer and a creator who put that thing together. What I'm telling you is that you were designed and created by a loving God who took time to intricately knit you together in your mother's womb. The second thing that people would say sometimes is they would say, they would say, well, why does God care so much what I do with my body? You, you hear this term, my body, my body a lot, right? Get your hands off my body. It's my body. It's my choice. I get to make the decisions, my body. So really the question is, is does God say your body is yours? Believer? Like, does God say, hey, this is yours. Do with it as you please. Um, in, in the city of Corinth, which we talked about before, but just to kind of quick little refresh, the, the city of Corinth was sexually one of the most out there cultures. Um, and we've talked around the city of Ephesus and some of the different cities, but the city of Corinth was just as out there sexually. And so Paul's writing to this city, he's writing to this church, and he says this in 1 Corinthians 6. He says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. And somebody may would look at that. If you were to just cherry pick this scripture, this verse right out of the Bible, you'd say, see, look, even God says it's my own body. You know, it's mine. But if you keep reading to the very next verse, look at what Paul says in 19. He says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God. In other words, what Paul, I mean, yeah, what Paul's saying is he's saying, do you not realize that from the beginning, God designed your body to be a house for his spirit? 
Again, think about the forethought. Think about the design. Think about the, the way God saw this. He designed your body to be a place for his spirit to reside. That the moment you give your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit moves in to your body that becomes a temple. Then he says this. He said, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. And we know that's a very high price, the death of his son. He's saying, listen, your body's not your own. Okay, it's been paid for, it's been bought. I sent my son to go to a cross to die for you because I love all of you, your entire person, not just your mind, not just your spirit, not just your soul. I love all of you. I, want all, I, I care for every bit of you. And then Paul says, in light of all of this, look at the very last part of this, in light of all of this, he says, therefore, honor God with your bodies. In other words, our bodies matter to God. Our bodies matter to God. We are connected with him. Think about this. Not only did, did the, the image of God in Genesis 1, and now the Holy Spirit moves in and, and, and we become a temple. Our body becomes a temple of the Holy Spirit. But remember, just a few months ago, we talked about one day there will be a resurrection of our bodies. Right? And you and I are going to live in eternity in a new creation with no sin and disease and sickness. In what? In a new restored body. A body that's no longer affected by the sin and disease and decay of our world. Why? Because our bodies matter. It's part of who we are. It's how God created us. But even more so than that, Jesus, when he came, he came in a body. Right? He came in a body and his body hung on a cross for you and I. His body got up from a grave. His body ascended to heaven. And right now in a body, Jesus is sitting next to God the Father. Why? Because bodies matter. Our bodies matter. We are created in that way. So what the world would say, here's what the world says. The world says that your body is just raw material with no moral value. But the word, God says, your body is made in God's image, mind, body, and soul interconnected. That's who you are. But this brings up another question. So we talked about what's God's view of our body. The second question would be this. What do I do when my mind and my body are at war with each other? Because really, whenever you look at gender dysphoria and you look at the transgender movement, this is the question. This is the central question because my mind is telling me one thing. My mind is telling me I'm this gender, but my body is displaying this gender. And there's a war between mind and body. What do I do about that? that this is kind of the crux. In, the, in that documentary, um, they said this. They're speaking about kids, but this could be, this is about everyone. At the heart of the debate about transgender children is the idea that your brain can be at war with your body. And that's the, that's the crux of the entire thing. Okay, this is actually what gender dysphoria means. The word dysphoria means um, kind of a dissatisfaction, an unease. There's turmoil. There's something's not right. It's actually the opposite of euphoria. And actually, the whole kind of war and battle between mind and body is an, is an attempt to get to euphoria, right? To get away from the dis-ease, to get away from the, the, the dissatisfaction, to get away from the kind of the pain and to move toward happiness and fulfillment and purpose. That's the heart of the whole thing. But there's a battle between mind and body. There's a battle going on inside uh, anyone dealing or struggling with this. And my guess is there's, again, some folks right here, right now. There may be some students. There may be some adults. There may be some people dealing and battling and feeling this very real war between my mind is telling me one thing and my body is telling me another thing. What do I do? And I find it really, really interesting. And I don't in any way mean to discount those experiencing or struggling with gender dysphoria whenever I say this. But I find it interesting that there is an entire group of people that experience this exact same battle between mind and body, or mind and heart. And that would be Christians. You and I, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, there is an internal war happening inside of us between an old self and a new self, right? Between an old reality and a new reality, between old lies that you've believed or sin patterns or, I mean, honestly, the biggest, the biggest issue in the church today isn't transgenderism. It isn't homosexuality. The biggest issue in the church today is pornography. Like a hundred times more than any of these other issues, 
Right? It's an underlying sin that stays and there's this constant battle inside us as believers that go, there's this sin, there's this lie, there's this old pattern, there's this old thing, but yet I know what God says about me and we struggle in this place to ultimately kind of put away our own desires and take on the design that God has for us. Paul in Romans 7, he said it so clearly. He said this, I love God's law with all of my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind and this power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Right? There's just, there's these, there's these wicked desires, there's these, these desires that go against God, but at the same time, I so badly want to follow God. And there's this struggle and there's this battle and there's this war within us. I say that to say this. Number one, we understand what that feels like. We understand if you're a believer and you're trying to follow the way of Jesus, you understand that tension. You understand that war. You understand that battle. To me, it means that it should make Christians the most compassionate people in this conversation. That when you and I have conversations with someone that are struggling and experiencing gender dysphoria, we should, we should be the most compassionate people because we have the best sense, the closest sense of what that internal war feels like, right? We, we get it. We understand what it feels like. But what's the solution for this? What's the solution for this battle? Here's what the world would say. The solution for this battle is to listen to your mind and alter your body. Okay? The word, God, would say the solution is this. Let God transform your mind and embrace the body that he gave you. Okay? That's the word. That's God's solution to this. And Romans 12, 1 says this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. That word holy means set apart. In other words, your thinking can't be like the world's. It's gotta be set apart from the world's thinking. It's gotta be set apart from culture. It's gotta be different. It's gotta be, it, it, it cannot look like that. It's gotta be holy. And what do you do? You lay it down. That's, that's what this sacrifice looks like. And look, what, this is truly the way to worship him. In other words, I'm taking my body, my, my, my entire person, all of me, and I'm laying it at the feet of Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm sacrificing everything to him. I'm laying everything down to him. This is what we've been called to do. This is the way we, we ultimately, we're gonna see in a second, renew our mind. But if you, if you remember, the, the kind of the culture right now is to express yourself, right? It's all about, you know, you, you're the God of your own life. You get to express yourself. But if you go to the gospels, you look and you see something quite different. Jesus said, whenever you're a follower of him, what does he say? He says, deny yourself. He says, deny yourself, pick up the cross, follow him. In other words, lay down those old desires, lay down those old things. Just what he's saying right here, this holy and acceptable sacrifice means I'm gonna, I'm gonna put away all those other things and I'm gonna lay all of my life down to him. Jesus, whatever you say is what goes in my life. This is the way I'm choosing to live. And then Paul says in verse two, he says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by what? By changing the way you think. Then, then you will learn how to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Remember what, we're, what, what culture is ultimately after is euphoria. It's happiness, it's fulfillment, it's purpose. And Paul says the way to that is not changing your body, the way to that is changing your mind, right? It's transforming the way that we think. And what's so sad and just honestly kind of wild about culture right now is that there is zero conversation about changing the mind. All of the conversation is just about changing the body, right? Changing the physical. And there's no concept, there's no thought, there's no conversation about what it could look like to work on the mind. Nancy Piercy in, in, in Love Thy Body, she said this, she said, why is it considered acceptable to carve up a person's body to match their inner sense of self, but bigoted to help them change their sense of self to match their body? Feelings can change, but the body is an observable fact that does not change. It makes sense to treat it as a reliable marker of gender identity, right? Because feelings change, our body doesn't. Our body is a fact. 
Just imagine this scenario if a young 15, 16 year old teenage girl who was anorexic walked into a pediatrician's office. 15, 16 years old, and it's obvious she's anorexic. She's 80 pounds. And she begins to share with the pediatrician about how she feels fat, she feels overweight. Her mind is telling her that when she looks in the mirror, she's overweight and she's disgusting and she needs to lose weight. And she comes to this doctor and she says, Doc, I need you to help me lose weight. Right? A compassionate doctor, actually any doctor, any doctor is gonna look at that child and say, honey, we need to work on your mind, not on your body, right? Obviously, there's a disconnect between what you're seeing, what you're feeling in your mind and the way you actually look, like what's actually going on. There's a disconnect there. So what we need to work on is your mind. We need to renew your mind. We need to change your mind. Okay, this is exactly what Paul is saying. And what's wild to me, and honestly cruel, the way culturally we're treating adolescents right now, because the moment, the moment there are feelings of gender dysphoria, of confusion, of this war within, the moment those things happen, the first step is to begin working on the body. Let's change the body, right? Let's implement something else. And there are study after study after study. There's one book called um, Irreversible Damage by Abigail Shire. Uh, She says that 70% of adolescents who experience gender dysphoria will phase out of it if there is no medical treatment made whatsoever. 70% will phase out of it if no one tries to change their gender physically. Dr. Paul McHugh, who's a secular doctor at Johns Hopkins, he said this, um, if you don't, Abigail's a Christian, so maybe you don't believe her, but this guy's not a Christian, so maybe you'll believe him. When children who reported transgender feelings were tracked without medical or surgical treatment at both Vanderbilt University and London's Portman Clinic, 70 to 80% 70 of them spontaneously lost those feelings. It's so sad what we're doing. It's cruel what we're doing to try to change a body instead of working on the mind. And whenever we go to God's word as believers, and if you are a believer and you're struggling with this, God's word says you go to him. You lay your body, you lay all of you down and you separate your thinking from the world's thinking and you ask God to come in and renew your mind. And the reality is, let me just, uh, because as Christians, we know this to be true, but let me just say it really plainly. The reality is, is that when you do that, if you're struggling with these kind of feelings, that tension most likely will not go away. I mean, if you've ever struggled with a sin, if you've ever struggled with a lie, if you've ever struggled with something that you can't let go of, even as a believer, there's a constant struggle there. So the tension may not go away, but what I guarantee you is that God will be with you in the middle of that tension. There will be care and support and love. He will be right there and your church family will be right there walking with you as you struggle and as you battle that, as you work every single day to renew your mind. That brings me to the third question. Third question is this, what does the science say? What does the science say? This will be really, really quick um, because the science is interesting. The science says you cannot change your gender. The science says you cannot change your gender. It's impossible. No matter what you cut, carve, rebuild, reconstruct, what kind of puberty blockers, hormone treatment, no matter what you do, it is impossible to change your gender. Why? Because every cell in our bodies have a sex. Every cell, in our, all 37 trillion of them are either XX or XY. So no matter what happens to the physical body, no matter what is introduced, even through hormones, whatever, it's impossible to actually change the body. And what's interesting to me is that whenever, culturally, whenever we separate um, biology from sex or biology from gender, whenever we've separated it in this way, what happens is, is, it, is it means we don't have a way to define gender and sex anymore. It changes and kind of creates a conundrum. Like, how do we define what sex is? How do we define what a gender is? It, 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 it creates a problem. And honestly, nobody has an answer for that. How do we define gender? How do we define sex? 
Nobody has an answer for that. So because we don't have an answer and because those two things have been separated, biology from gender, because they've been separated, we are left to only being able to identify or define or characterize gender by stereotypes, by appearance, by how someone looks. And honestly, I think women have been working just culturally and, and for a while now have been working so hard to get away from stereotypes, to get away from feeling like, oh yeah, this is what a woman is, right? I mean, I, I was tempted to throw some images up here and just go, is this what a woman is? You know, cleavage and, and thick mascara and, and, and you know, the, the fancy, fancy this and the girly, girly that, is that what a woman is? You would say, no, absolutely not. Right? But what it does is it limits us to be able to say the only way we can define gender now is by a stereotype. The only way we can do that is by the way someone looks, their appearance. And so then what happens is you've got a girl or a woman or a young woman that doesn't like all the girly stuff. Right? And this has been happening for generations. Right? They don't like the normal girly stuff. So what do we do? We say, oh, they're boyish. Oh, they're a tomboy. Oh, they're this or that. Right? Or you could flip it with a boy. The same thing, oh, the, you know, this little guy, he doesn't like all the normal boyish stuff. He doesn't like the manly stuff. So what do we do? We start putting labels on him. We start calling him sissy. We start calling him a girl, right? And it just begins to confuse and create problems. Why? Because what our society is doing is we're just, we, we are forced to define gender by appearance and stereotypes. And all it's doing is continuing to hurt. And honestly, the transgender movement does not help this. It actually magnifies this. It forces it. It, 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 it makes it get even bigger. We, like the transgender movement needs stereotypes in order to honestly live and operate. It's based on that. You know, they say when you look at the kind of the, the high correlations between gender dysphoria and even same sex, sex attraction, when you kind of look at what's the, the highest correlation between those things, it's not genetics, it's not family of origin. The highest thing is what's called childhood gender nonconformity. And it's because at some point a child felt different than what they were being told their sex was supposed to be. They just felt different, whether that's somebody telling them or they look at the world and they go, oh, that's what a man's supposed to look like and I feel different. I don't like the same things. I don't do the same things. Or a little girl that looks and says, I don't, I don't know what to do. I, I'm different. I don't, I, don't, I don't think I'm supposed to be this way. Something's wrong with me. My body's wrong. Because as a society, we've locked male and female into very narrow compartments. And really what needs to happen is we need to broaden our definition of male and female, right? Because every guy doesn't like hunting and fishing and football, right? Every woman doesn't like, you know, the, the stereotypical woman things. Like, like there's, there's, our categories need to be expanded. We need to, we need to broaden that. And as a church, as the church, I don't think the church has helped really. I think we've perpetuated those same stereotypes in so many ways, the big C church. We've kept those same things going and we've maybe even said some of those things and maybe my guess is some of you, you've heard some of those lies. I mean, maybe you would say, well, I definitely don't struggle with gender dysphoria, but right now you're pulling up some lies that a coach or a dad or, or, or a teacher or somebody spoke over you that is still haunting you to this day. And at the root of that is the enemy. It's a lie of the enemy that's trying to, to, to just to dig out the foundation of who God says you are. And so you need to, everybody right now, you need to look at me. If you're a man, I want you to know you're a man of God. And you have purpose. And you have destiny. And God called you and he set you apart. And he has a purpose for your life. If you're a woman, you're a woman of God. And you're glorious and mighty and fierce. And God has called you and he's got a calling on his life. When I think about David in the Bible, David loved to sit in the pasture and play his harp and write poetry and sing songs. There's even a story about him dancing half naked in front of all of his friends. Would you say that David is a man? Absolutely. I think about Deborah who was a judge, and in that day in the Old Testament, a judge was a military leader, 
So Deborah was this fierce, amazing woman that was leading the troops in the battle, full brave heart, blue paint down her face, fighting. She was also a prophet. You talk about a woman in a man's world. She was a prophet in the Old Testament, speaking God's word. Would you say she's a woman? Absolutely. This is what we have to understand and reclaim and listen to his words about us, not the world's words about us. Not the lies of culture and the lies of the world and the lies that have been spoken and maybe the lies that are still rattling around in our heads. We have to stand firm in who he says we are. My fourth and final question is this, how do we love people well? How do we love people well that are struggling or even experiencing gender dysphoria? Number one, I would say this, as a church, we will not reject We will not reject people who are battling or struggling with gender dysphoria. We will not mock people who are struggling. We will love them because they are created in the image of God and because they have a purpose. We will love them with all that we've got right now. The world is very much confusing love and affirmation. We can love someone really, really well without affirming their lifestyle, okay? Jesus loves me really, really well, but he doesn't affirm every decision I make. He doesn't affirm every desire in my heart, but he loves me more than anybody else in this room. Right, so we're gonna love people really, really well. But two, we're also gonna lead them to the way of Jesus. Lovingly. Lovingly, we're gonna, we're gonna walk with people to help them understand who they are in God. We're gonna walk with people in a compassionate and grace-filled way where we can bring truth and we can bring exactly what we've talked about, Romans 12, where there's a renewing of the mind and there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a throwing our body at the feet of Jesus. Like that's how we disciple people. We love them well and we bring the truth of God's word of who Jesus says they are. Church, I'll let you clap for that. I do want to mention one resource for those that, that are struggling or experiencing. There's, a, there's one of the resources on the site. It's called the Center uh, for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender. Uh, if you're a parent, there's some great resources on there, some videos, some courses, some classes. If you're in the lifestyle or DR, actually experiencing it, living out, there's some great resources there. So I would encourage you to check that out. But here's what I want to do before we go. I know I'm a little over time. Um, but I want, I want to just challenge you to sit tight for just another second. Um, let's do this. Don't go anywhere. Don't leave. I'm about to do something really risky because normally when I have you stand up, you start running. Don't leave, okay? Every campus, I want to, I want to ask you to stand up. Every campus, go ahead and stand up, but don't leave. Don't even pick your stuff up. Just stand up. And I want you just to look at me. Mobile, Foley, just look at me. Online, just look at me. And we stay focused right here. Because in just a moment at every campus, I'm going to call our ministry team to come down front. And I want you standing because I want to, I want to again, kind of give the opportunity for people to move without maybe being singled out. This is such a personal issue. Some people are proudly living maybe this lifestyle out. But for a lot of people, and especially people here, it just may be an internal struggle. And I just want to create an environment as best we can for you to come and be ministered to. Because my guess is there has been a lie that's been identified today. Maybe. Maybe you didn't even know what the struggle was, but today you're like, yeah, there was a lie spoken. There was something said. There was a way I was treated. And now I see it. It's, It's just bubbling up to the surface or... Or maybe you've been living this lie that there's a mind-body split and you know what, I am my mind and I can do whatever I want with my body. Who are you to say I can't do something with my body? And then today to go, oh, wait a minute, I'm God's. And he created me and he loves me and, I'm, and it's just this whole person that he wants, that he desires. And maybe today you just need to confess or maybe, maybe you've got a child that's struggling and you just go, man, I need somebody to stand with me. I need prayer, I need help. And you just need the church to come around you and pray. So let's do this. Every campus, would our ministry team just please come on to the front and just line up 
And the church family, if you'll just close your eyes, I'm going to pray. And then whenever I'm done praying, um, I'll give you some instructions to come, but it'll be really, really simple. But I just want to pray a prayer. Our ministry team's here. They're ready. They're prepared. Guys, we've been praying for this. We've been, we've been asking for God's wisdom and, and his ability to not only communicate, but to be able to minister to you. So let's just pray right now, God, I thank you that one, Holy Spirit, you're here, you're with us. And Lord, we just lift you up. And God, we thank you that you are so good. God, that you've communicated today so much better than I have. Your love and your grace and your, God, your commitment to, to us, to humanity, God, that you put your image on us. And Lord, I pray today, God, that some lives could have been, would, would have been broken off, that some, God, some, some old thinking, old patterns, God, or some struggles, God, that you would just bring some, some light to, God. I pray ultimately that the Holy Spirit would come into every situation, every lie, and dismantle it right now in Jesus' name. God, that the power of God would begin to well up inside of us, Lord, that we would sense your love, that we would sense, God, God, your joy. We would sense, God, that, 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 that we are very good in the way that you spoke in Genesis 1, that when you look at us, you say, man, they are very good. I pray that today that's what we would sense and that's what we would feel. And today, God, that we would make some bold steps maybe. Some bold steps to say, I'm not going to live according to the mindsets and the patterns of the world any longer. I'm going to live according to God's word. I'm going to allow God's word to transform my mind and I'm not going to alter my body. I'm not even going to think that way. I'm not even going to begin to think in this, with this dichotomy between mind and body. But God, I'm going to be unified. I'm going I'm to operate and live this way. So, Lord, I pray right now, whoever you're speaking to, give them the boldness and the courage, Lord, to move, to come, to come and just simply let us pray for them. Or whether it's a child they're coming for or a loved one or it's themselves, Lord, I just pray, God, give us the boldness today to move. God, we love you so much, and we give every bit of it to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in and, and for experiencing this service with us. What we find in scripture is an encouragement, not just to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And the encouragement that we want to leave you with in light of that is don't let this just be content. You see, on this platform, you'll see a lot of content. There's a lot of things that can fill a lot of your time, but we want this to be more. We want this to be life transformative in the next step that it sets up in your life. On the screen right now, you're gonna see a QR code just kind of flash up there. We'd love for you to scan that QR code, and what it's gonna be is it's going to help you find that next step to connect with us. And in that, we can help direct you to whatever is that next step in your life to connect you, not just with content, which you found, but also with the body, with other believers, with people who are walking the same journey, whether it be from a place of honest questions and doubt to a place of, hey, I want to grow and mature in my relationship with God. But we want to thank you for tuning in with us. We love spending the time with you, and we'll see you later.